Have you been trying to watch Glenn Greenwald's show System Update on TikTok? Well, you won't find it. The platform banned his show last week, as Glenn noted on X, with no notice and no explanation whatsoever. Glenn added that the whole thing is Kafkaesque and that they give you no explanation, let alone any opportunity to appeal or be heard. Here to discuss this very troublesome censorship story about TikTok and freedom of speech is host of System Update, Glenn Greenwald, a friend of the show. We're so grateful to have you with us, Glenn. Yeah, great to be with you guys. Thanks for covering this. So uh, give us give us the facts. Um, when did you realize the, the show was no longer being posted there? Is it is it clips? Is it like short video aspects of it from your from your like official account on, t- on TikTok? What's what's the landscape? Right. So our show is uh, primarily a show where it airs live on Rumble. That's where the entire show is broadcast and then hosted. But we use clips of the show like most shows do and use various social media, Twitter and YouTube and Instagram and TikTok. Or we have a social media manager who's great and she takes clips that are specifically catered to TikTok. It's not a crucial platform for us that we have had parts of our show viralized several times before and we're building somewhat of an audience there. And what's so interesting is I've obviously covered big tech censorship as a reporter, as a journalist for a long time. I've been denouncing big tech censorship, but I've never actually been victimized by it. I've never so much as even had a video taken down, even in the post in the pre Elon Musk regime on Twitter. I never once had a post removed, except I think one time I cursed somebody because uh, when my husband was first entering politics, I couldn't handle him being criticized. But other than that, I've never been a victim of this sort of big tech censorship. And our social media manager went to log in to TikTok to post the latest clip. And there was a message she got saying, your account has been permanently banned. We hadn't gotten any warning. We hadn't gotten any notice. And then she tried to find out. She did an appeal. And we just got back this automated note saying, you are permanently banned. There's no appeals. It will remain banned. And to this very day, we can't even find out a reason why. And... You know, it just goes to show you that relying in any way on big tech, I mean, imagine if that were our platform that we relied on, it can they can just destroy your platform. They have, provide no explanation and just the range of permissible views is so limited and narrow on these platforms that this is why I spend so much of my time building up free speech platforms and alternative platforms like Rumble. Now, Glenn, people are going to hear this happen on TikTok. They're going to hear you say, um, with how outspoken I've been in the past, I've still never been censored on any other platform. They're going to look at all of the members of Congress who have been attacking TikTok, pushing for a TikTok ban, precisely because of the nature of the content on TikTok, specifically pro-Palestinian content. And people are going to look at the fact that you've been doing so much important coverage of uh, what's been going on in Gaza and the West Bank. And they're going to try to connect the dots and say, well, do you think, Glenn, that you were censored specifically because of your uh, uh, co- uh, coverage of uh, abuses of Palestinians by Israel in the IDF? Why do you think you were censored? This is the most interesting thing. There has been a bipartisan effort to ban TikTok. The Biden White House has threatened to ban TikTok from being in the United States. The FBI and the CIA both want it banned. And m- many Republican presidential candidates and member of Congress want it banned. And the narrative that they've united around has been that TikTok should be banned because it is a weapon of the Chinese Communist Party that is used to propagandize the American public, especially young Americans, to be angry at their own government. Now, the first time I ever started questioning that narrative is we did once get a video taken down. It was a video where it was where we were very critical of President Zelensky and the U.S. war policy in Ukraine. And it didn't make sense if the purpose of TikTok is to be used as a weapon of China to divide Americans against their own government. They should love my show. All we do is criticize the U.S. government, the U.S. security state. And as we looked into it more, what we discovered is that this threat to ban TikTok from a very lucrative market for them, which is the U.S., has resulted in TikTok saying to the U.S. security state, look, we don't really care. We're just capitalists. We just want to make money. And if we need to turn over to you the power to censor and you tell us what speech you find threatening, we will do that. We'll censor as you, the CIA and the FBI, tell us to the way they do with Facebook and Google and Twitter, as we saw in the Twitter files. And I think that's really what has been happening is mm. they have the, the, the power to content moderate on Twitter has been commandeered by these U.S. security state agencies. 
That's very interesting. Uh, yeah, obviously. So, so when the narrative was forming that um, that uh, uh, China, the Chinese government is maybe have is influencing the kind of content that appears on TikTok. So, I, I think the pro Palestinian views on TikTok are largely genuine. I can tell among young people, left leaning young people. I, I don't necessarily think it's being manipulated. I, I can't rule out, given what our own government did to try to control the narrative about elections and COVID on, on Facebook and X and other platforms, I, I wouldn't rule out that the Chinese government tried to exert some level of similar authority on whatever questions matter to it on its own platform, given that I, we, we now know that happened with our own government. I don't I think China would necessarily be more well-behaved on this subject. But you're saying you think they want to get along with, with U.S. domestic intelligence agencies? Right. So on that video that I just referenced, where we criticized the war in Ukraine, it was taken down. We got a strike. We were notified we could be at risk of losing the account. We actually appealed that, and they reinstated that video. The only time any video actually got taken down and they refused to reinstate it was a video of ours that went very viral that was about the interference on the part of the CIA in the Brazilian election in 2022. It was based on mainstream media reports and some reporting I did. It went super viral because we put Portuguese subtitles on it. Brazilians were very interested in it. That was the only strike we got. So this is a video criticizing the U.S. security state. Why would the Chinese government be mad at us for that? This The TikTok also just recently banned any discussion of that bin Laden letter after it went viral, which blames the U.S. government for why 9-11 happened, saying you've been interfering in our world with bombs and wars. They banned that letter and that's the, the the reality of TikTok, Robbie, is that the CEO is not a Chinese national. He was born in Singapore. He's a capitalist. He went to the London School of Economics, worked for Goldman Sachs after going to Harvard Business School. They're desperate not to lose access to the U.S. market. Google and Facebook make concessions all the time to India, to China, where they say, look, we want to stay in your very lucrative market. So we'll censor as you tell us. And this is what's happening with TikTok is the U.S. security state is saying, if you want to stay in the U.S., you need to take down content that we regard as dangerous. That's who's in the driver's seat. So I can't tell answer brief for sure. Was it our criticism of the Israel war? Was it because we're criticizing Ukraine? Was it because we're saying this about TikTok? I've done shows kind of defending TikTok, saying it's not a weapon of the CCP. It's more that they've submitted to the U.S. security state. But whatever it is, something we were doing TikTok didn't like, and usually the target of our criticism is the U.S. government and the U.S. security state. That's what our show is about. You know, Glenn, it's frankly sort of overwhelming to keep track of all of the censorship stories that are going on right now. Uh, you recently tweeted in response to some Harvard Crimson coverage of the House passing bipartisan resolution calling for uh, Harvard President Claudine Gay's resignation. You said, quote, this is infinitely more dangerous than any cancel culture controversy that provoked so much anger. We obviously have been covering um, because it's so important, uh, all of the Twitter files uh, discourse and some of the soft and hard pressures that were exerted on social media companies. But now we're seeing so much, very much out loud censorship happening in real life, coming directly from Congress, putting very open uh, pressure in a bipartisan way on the kinds of speech that can happen at our institutions of higher learning. Why do you think this is, um, uh, what did you say, infinitely more dangerous than some of the cancel culture uh, campaigns that we've seen in the past? Well, remember the kind of cancel culture controversies that happened in the past that ended up being kind of trivial in comparison. I mean, like David Shore at the beginning of the Black Lives Matter uh, protest, he's a Democratic operative, and he said, you know what, if you look at history, it seems like nonviolent protest works better than violent protest. And that was perceived as a criticism of the Black Lives Matter movement at a time when it wasn't allowed. He got okay. fired from his job. He became a folk hero. He's now very gainfully employed. You know, most of these people end up becoming free speech martyrs. They do very well. Over the last two months, you have had formal censorship, like Ron DeSantis banning pro-Palestinian groups on the University of Florida campuses on the grounds that they're giving material support to Hamas through their speech. You've had an endless number of firings on college campuses, in media, for people criticizing Israel. And now you have the Congress formally telling private universities we want you to get rid of this president because they're not sufficiently hawkish on stopping anti-Semitic discourse in universities. You have this tidal wave of censorship that's very bipartisan that come from the people who have spent a lot of years branding themselves very lucratively as being free, free, free speech warriors. And I think it kind of makes all these 
other prior years of cancel culture examples pale in comparison, though I do think there has been a lot of censorship on college campuses, and that's the one argument I have sympathy for, which is these college administrators don't have any credibility to claim they're defending free speech, given how much censorship they've imposed. But now it's become very bipartisan ever since October 7th. Yeah, that would be that was my criticism of the responses by the college presidents as well. You know, with the answers they were giving are maybe displeasing for people to hear, but are broadly correct that the examples they were giving, well, it does depend on the context. We all know from First Amendment um, uh, 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 litigation from court cases on this that it actually does matter your your time, place, and matter of how you make a statement. If your statement is hateful but you know but generalized or so specific or in the face of one person, these are actually like the relevant criteria for whether this is a legal speech or permissible speech. So it's fine for me, from my perspective, when they were saying that well, it really does depend on the context. But as you noted, you know the criticism that. Uh, organizations like the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression has had for years is that on, on so many categories of speech, it, it, context has not mattered. In fact, they, they sent, set up entire bias reporting systems at hundreds of universities where you are encouraged to report any slight, anything anyone says to you that makes you uncomfortable. That was You were supposed to take that to the administrator. You're supposed to call the cops about that. And so now they're saying, well, now, now, they're, now they're saying the correct thing, and it, it, it is terrible that they're getting pressure to cave on that from a lot of people who said that they were for pro-free speech. Obviously, that is certainly hypocritical. Well, and just to emphasize that point about context, even though this two-minute clip viralized of Elise Stefanik, you know, questioning them on whether they regard advocacy of genocide of Jews as incompatible with uh, the code of conduct on their campus, the context for that discussion, what happened before that viral clip, was what has been happening, which is an attempt to take standard pro-Palestinian phrases like intifada, which is just an Arabic word for uprising. It doesn't necessarily mean violence, although even if it did mean violence, you're allowed to advocate violence against the state of Israel, just like you're allowed to say bomb Iran or flatten Gaza. But what they were really resisting was this idea that standard pro-Palestinian phrases like intifada or free Palestine or Palestine shall be free from the river to the sea are inherently genocidal. And that's why they were saying it depends on the context. Like you can't march up to a Jewish student every day and get in their face and say, murder all Jews. That's harassment of a specific student. Right. But if you want to write an op-ed saying free Palestine, of course that's free speech. And we should be applauding that. And while you're right that these universities have had a history of censoring, a lot of the censorship for many years has been aimed at Israel critics. People like Norman Finkelstein being denied tenure or Stephen Salacia being fired from the University of Illinois for criticizing Israel. It's not like this is new. And I think that's a really important point is that censorship of right wing speech, but also censorship of Israel critics have been persisting for a long time, both in campus and the society more broadly. Speaking of Norman Finkelstein, and we've been having this conversation a bit on the show about how to read the uh, accusations of Claudine Gay, Harvard's president, having plagiarized um, in the con broader context of what's been going on um, with the speech campaigns and the conversation around what's going on in Israel and Gaza. Uh, you know, even if we agree that it's pretextual, does it matter if the underlying claims are true? What should happen to her? Um, is it validating these free speech, the attack on speech, to dismiss her for other reasons, even if they are legitimate and substantive? And does it affect the analysis when you read in what has happened to other Harvard professors who have been accused of plagiarism, like um, Norm Finkelstein has accused uh, Alan Dershowitz, for example, who has not obviously been fired from Harvard's faculty. Have you thought much about any of this? I mean, obviously it matters in a vacuum, like in theory, if the president of Harvard has engaged in serious plagiarism, it's considered whether I agree with it or not, like one of the most serious transgressions can, can be committed in academia. Students get expelled for it at Harvard and everywhere all the time. There's no reason she should be exempt. The problem is, is that, of course, you can't separate the plagiarism accusations from the reasons they're being launched now, which is as punishment against her for permitting too much criticism of Israel on her campus. You have Bill Ackman, this multi-billionaire hedge fund manager who's not only after her head on a pike, like he was and got the president of Penn fired, but also the president of MIT. Suddenly he's raising issues about NGO spending and whether there's conflicts of interest. Clearly the whole point here is to punish these administrators for purely ideological reasons. Of course, it's a pretext. It doesn't make the accusations inherently false. I'm just very skeptical that these claims of concerns over 
intellectual integrity are authentic. And I think it makes it very hard to assess the seriousness of the accusations, given how inextricably linked where they are with the desire to destroy these people for totally independent reasons having to do with ideology and politics. Mm. Yeah, that's a tough one. Look, we really appreciate you joining us today, Glenn. It's always such a pleasure. And welcome to the club of people who have been, or shows have been banned on social media. Uh, and, and, you know, you're the all-time great, so I would have expected to happen to you already, but, uh, you know, we can, we can celebrate it. Yeah, it was it. It's overdue, so I'm, I'm kind of relieved it finally happened. Great to see you guys. Same here. Bye.